Hello, thank you for joining me tonight. My name's Karen Tripp and I'm here to do a book reading. So before I head into chapter three, I thought I would take a minute tonight to share with you a little bit about how the book is laid out. This is called God is Bigger Than Your Cancer, Christian Insights for Cancer Patients. Uh, it's a small book, but it is divided up into four different chapters and each chapter has two sections. And so we read one section every Thursday night um, right here at 630 Central, and uh, we're about halfway through the book almost. So I'm pretty excited to be able to share tonight with you. Tonight is specifically a story that's about my son. Um, and he is now um, a full-size adult, but I'm going to read you a story about when he was a first grader and some of the things that took place and some of the things that happened as me being a mom too. So you'll get a little insight into that insanity. But uh, I'm glad you're here. Um, the questions and all that we end up addressing in the book really have to do with people that are coping with cancer, but it also, in a general sense, has to do with suffering, of trying to be able to understand how suffering ends up impacting our lives and how God fits into all of that. How do we look around and be able to say, okay, I can see where God is in the midst of this difficult time. And so tonight I'm going to read chapter three and it's called Why Me? Oh, I forgot to tell you the title of the book. The title of the book is God is Bigger Than Your Cancer. All right, chapter three, Why Me? Why did I get cancer? So the section we're gonna read this evening is called The Trials of a First Grader. It's impossible not to ask, why me? Did I do something to deserve cancer? Is there something I should have done to prevent this? As humans, it's easy to dwell on things we did not measure up. I should have drunk less soda and more juice. I should have called my parents more and yelled at my kids less. Questions about cancer are often directed towards God. If only I had gone to church more or prayed more, then maybe God wouldn't have given me cancer. If only I hadn't done so many things wrong, God would have spared me the suffering. God does not work like that. God does not inflict people with cancer. Maybe your question to God is, why me? I've done so many things right, so how can I have cancer? Understand this, living every day to honor Jesus will not prevent cancer. It would be nice if things were that simple, since being good can't prevent all struggles. Then what does cause the struggles in your life? Perhaps it would help to look at the simple life of a first grader. As my son Garrett walked from the idyllic time of the childhood paradise known as kindergarten into the adventure of first grade, I heard a door slam shut. No longer were his days filled with playing on the floor and listening to stories as he drifted off to sleep. Now he sat at a desk complete with worksheets and dare I say it, he had homework. The impact was obvious the first day of school when my unending ball of energy came home from school and laid on the couch until supper. My prodding and the sounds of his friends playing outside could not budge him. What changed? My son had discovered work and he was tired. First grade was hard work. After a week or two, Garrett's energy level returned. Then he came home with a note from his teacher. Garrett was throwing rocks on the playground and will miss recess for a week. This note was followed by my son's tears, pleadings, and of course, never rattling, nerve rattling nerve anticipation of his father coming home. Now my son found more than just work at first grade. He had found consequences. Then came the infamous bus incident. Garris bus stop was the next neighborhood over, so I would drive him to and from the bus stop. One afternoon, I was late meeting the bus. Garrett spent the next 45 minutes riding the bus to the end of the line where I met him. As he climbed off the bus, tired, frustrated, and scared, there were more tears and pleas but this time they were mine. Garrett found persecution. 
What are the causes for struggles in life? Struggles can in some ways fall into three categories. One, struggles due to our circumstances. We live in a fallen world where work, burden, and cancer are a part of life. Garrett's exhaustion was due to no fault of his own, but rather the fatigue of moving from a half-day kindergartner to a full-day first grader. Cancer is indiscriminate and unfair. Fair would be bad people like murderers, rapists, and terrorists getting cancer. Unfair is when cancer hits a mother of young children, a hardworking grandpa ready to enjoy his retirement, an innocent child, a loving sister, or a precious best friend. Cancer is not sent by God, but is a horrendous darkness in this fallen world. Number two, struggles due to disobedience. We're all tempted and too often choose to do what we desire instead of what God desires. Is there any greater temptation to a six-year-old boy than a rock on a playground? Regardless, this type of struggle is the consequence of our own behavior. Cancer is not a struggle of disobedience. Cancer victims do not do anything to deserve cancer. That's why someone who suffers from it is called a cancer victim. If you have cancer, God is not punishing you. There is no tally sheet in heaven where God tracks your sins and then punishes you with cancer. Nor is there a list of faithful people that are immune to the darkness of cancer. Number three, struggles due to conviction. We're following the will of God and suddenly other people's sins cause us pain, even to the point of persecution. My negligence at the bus stop caused Garrett to struggle under no fault of his own. There are some cancer cases which are the result of another person's sin. These are cases where someone has contaminated a work or home environment with no regard to the danger and places for others. Unfortunately, most cancer is not due to a specific location or event. It is a condition of the world in which we live. Typically, there is no one to accuse and no one to convict for your cancer. This is what leads us to blame God. We want to know why. In Jesus' time, many of God's people believed that having an illness was the result of sin. Jesus' disciples asked him about a man who was blind since birth. Who sinned, this man or his parents? John 9, 2. We could just as easily ask the same of Jesus today. Imagine Jesus approaching and you asking, why Jesus, what did I do to deserve cancer? See him reach out to you and explain, just as he did to the blind man. You didn't do anything to deserve cancer. The reason you have cancer is so that the work of God may be displayed in your life. That's right. So God's work can be seen in your life. In the midst of your struggles, God will shine through. You may be asking, how am I supposed to display God's work for anybody? I'm just hanging on myself. Don't worry. It's not your job to figure out how God will shine through you. It's God's job. Your job is to hang on to Jesus the best way you can. If you hunger to understand how God is using your cancer, it can be frustrating to not see the evidence of God at work. You may only see frustration in the eyes of your family and fear in the eyes of your friends, but no shining ray of God's glory. It's okay if you can't see his glory shining through your life. It's there, God promised, really. Romans 8.28 states that in all things, God works for the good of those that love him. So if God's purpose remains a mystery, rest in the certainty that nothing bad ever happens that God cannot use for good. Just think of it. Even in the midst of a sinful world, God promises to work all things, every stupid, senseless, destructive, and evil thing 
for the good of those who love him. God uses tumors, low cell counts, and even nausea and fatigue to fulfill God's purpose. God would not be in complete control if he only used some things or even most things. God is in control and he uses all things. God promises more than showing his works to others. Read Romans 8, 28. For whom is God working? You. God promises to use his authority for your good. And God knows what is good. He knows we need his goodness. That's why he sent Jesus. Jesus will bring you blessings from burdens and hope from despair. It's true. He will bring you blessings from your burdens and hope from your despair. Lay your head back and rest in the loving arms of your heavenly father. Know that your cancer is not senseless. It has a purpose. God's purpose is for his glory to be revealed through you. All praises go to him. Hallelujah. And here is the closing verse for this section. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6-7. Think about that for a minute. That whole kind of notion that God can use all things, even the yucky parts of cancer, to be able to do his will. And I do think the frustrating part of all of that is not being able to see it. Sometimes I work with people and they'll say, oh my gosh, I can see the way God has used my cancer in so-and-so's life or in this situation or in my workplace or with my family or with my spouse. But sometimes people are like, I don't see it, I don't know. And I think there can be a burden sometimes that people have, especially Christians, to have a sense that I have to show people God through this cancer journey that I'm going through, regardless of how difficult it is. And you don't have to worry about that. God uses all things. That's his place. Your place is just to keep clinging to him. So any thoughts, any thoughts out there from anyone about what kind of a place you might have been in that it's hard sometimes to see where God is and what he's doing? Any thoughts about that? Could be in a cancer journey, could be in something else. Perhaps sometimes I've had people say the big things, you know, like coming up for large tests or coming up for large surgeries. Sometimes it's easier to see God in the bigger things than in the smaller things in life. And sometimes in cancer, that can end up being the side effects or disappointment that friends end up giving us or the sense of I can't keep up with everything and the futility of being wondering whether or not your work is going to be the same when you get back. Lots of things like that. So any thoughts? Places where it's hard to see God sometimes when you're in a struggle. All right. Well, let me close by saying one other thing before I say a quick prayer. Cancer Companions, the ministry that I work with, is doing a quarantine um, support group on Zoom right now. And so if that's something that you have an interest in learning more about, um, being able to be part of an online cancer Christian support group, just leave a little comment down there in the comment section, and that would be great. We'll make sure that we uh, get you the link to be able to find out more about that. I hope it is sunshiny where you are, and I hope that this finds you smiling. Bow your head with me. Lord, we thank you for all the hearts that are here tonight, and we ask for you to continue to go before each one of them, Lord, each one of them, and where you are able, reveal to them how you are using the struggles in their life in order to do amazing things that are for your kingdom. And if they can't see these things, Lord, if they're not meant to see these things, Lord, fill them with an overwhelming dose of, of your assurance and your faith and your strength. In your precious son's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Blessings. Bye-bye now. See you next week. Same time. 6.30 Thursday.